What you're about to see and hear exists in reality in Jamaica and has become one of the many unfortunate chapters. After accepting loans and conditionalities from the World Bank, lost its largest cash crop markets due to competition with Western imports. Today, countless farmers are out of work, for they are unable to compete with the large corporations. Greetings, massive. Wagwan, Jamaica. It is important that we make some connections with our history. The departure from course during this period of industrialization and industrial development was not due to external forces. It was due to the misadventure of the PNP which diverted us from the path of economic growth, selling the people of Jamaica false hope and unrealistic dreams for which the country is still paying today. Those countries that were not distracted from the path of economic development and maintained a steady and balanced course managed to align their education systems and their economies to take advantage of the opportunities of industrialization, even if they were lagging behind at the time of the third industrial revolution. The consequences of the corruption related to Operation Pride are the continuation and expansion of island-wide squatting, the facilitation of criminal enclaves, the frustration of inner city residents and the hundreds of millions of dollars lost that should have gone to solving the housing crisis. Operation Pride lost Jamaican taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars and failed to impact the squatter settlement issue as much as it could have. This harkened back to the late 1960s with the World Bank Education Loan, where once again numerous irregularities at the heart of which was political interference impacted Jamaican taxpayers not getting value for money. This time, sanctions did apply. The minister resigned, the permanent secretary resigned, and 13 persons were indicted. But this is not enough. National Integrity Action calls for more severe penalties to be attached to violation of Jamaica's procurement guidelines so that we put an end once and for all to politically motivated corruption, and the loss of value to Jamaican taxpayers. You have to find a way to lock up people who are involved in corruption, both at the government end and at the private sector end. And the only way to do that is to give prosecutor prosecutorial powers to an anti-corruption agency. You can but find for a league leader, you know, because you're going to say it's liable, you're going to get charged for liable. If you find for them and say, you used to give me a gun, you're going to say, you have any evidence of that? You can't prove it. So right away, you're going to prison. You see, who are going to prison? Are the victim of going to prison? Although the legal system is good and is righteous, takes so long to achieve an objective and to make a declaration in a case that may be brought. And I take, for example, an OLINT and a Cash Plus. Whereas in Jamaica, we have gone nowhere with Cash Plus and the people that were involved. In America, Madoff has gone to jail for, 400, for, for X number of years, certainly in excess of 100. And David Smith has been, has been found guilty and gone to jail. Between 2010 and 2011, David Smith, a Jamaican national, the head of Olind Corporation, a Ponzi scheme, was tried and convicted in the courts of Turks and Caicos, as well as in South Florida. Court documents reveal that Smith benefited to the tune of at least US $220 million. His main victims were Jamaicans, thousands of us, who put our well-earned income into this Ponzi scheme. In 2006, Jamaican professionals at the Financial Services Commission issued a cease and desist order to Smith. They were supported by the government, 
but opposed by politicians on both sides of the aisle. It turned out subsequently that Smith had given millions of US dollars to the Jamaica Labour Party and to the People's National Party. Could there be a relationship between those political donations and the fact that Smith was never prosecuted in Jamaica, despite the fact that Jamaicans were the main victims of his criminal activity? We do not know. But what we can say, and what National Integrity Action proposes, is that Jamaica needs robust campaign finance regulations laws that would ban organizations like Olint from making contributions to our political process. In addition, such legislation should reveal to us those who are making big contributions to the politicians and the political parties. Why? Because you and I know, he who pays the piper calls the tune. David Smith pleaded guilty to 18 counts of money laundering, four counts of wire fraud, and one count of conspiracy to commit money laundering. Did David Smith trade foreign exchange legitimately? Well, there has never been any finding of that. And um, not from the perspective of the FSC. We saw no evidence of that. Sometime in late 2005, information came to the FSC about an entity carrying on this type of business. When we looked at what we had, this was definitely securities business and under the law, the Securities Act, you need to be registered and the entity has to be licensed to be carrying on these activities. The FSC conducted a proper investigation which started in January of 2006. It was completed early March 2006, so within three months, the investigation was completed. In order to get additional information and utilizing the powers vested in the FSC under the FSC Act, we did a search and seizure operation on several locations. And from that, we seized records. In March 2006 also, as soon as we issued the cease and desist order, Simultaneously with that, we sent the files to the DPP's office for them to do their review with the hope that they would find it um, possible for prosecution to be brought against Mr. Smith and others. A part of what we asked for was no further funds flowing into these schemes and they were able to pay out. Now that's universally what is done. A goodly judge that heard that matter decided that Olin could continue to accept funds from current investors above the strenuous objection of the FSC because we knew that this is a way for funds to continue to flow in and to widen the base, the investor base, but we were unsuccessful. In terms of how Olint grew to be what it grew into, that has to be explained by the proliferation of the feeder funds. What is a feeder fund? A feeder fund is a sidekick to the main Ponzi scheme. It is the process by which you have sort of a smaller Ponzi scheme. It's a Ponzi within a Ponzi in this case. The media was also biased because now in hindsight, many inside the media houses were also investors and they had an interest to protect. And the following that they had, these are not the people with millions of dollars from cherry gardens, etc. These are the people who are going to be pooling together every little penny or taking, resigning from their jobs so that they could get access to their retirement fund to put into these schemes. That's how wide it went. Our vindication came from these other jurisdictions, some very mature jurisdictions, who were able to take the very same work that the FSC did 
because under our laws, and this is where I have to credit Jamaica, uh, we talk about everything else and what is bad, but what is also good, just like we have the freedom of the press here, there are laws on the books that if utilized properly, can actually get good work done. And the FSC did that. We were able to use sections of the FSC Act to cooperate and collaborate with foreign jurisdictions in order to help them bring Mr. Smith to book. The consequences relating to the Olin case were that billions of dollars were lost to Jamaica's GDP. There was the ruination of hundreds of professionals, proceeds of crime donated to political parties and politicians, and the worldwide reputation loss of the Jamaican justice system. But all is not lost. After years of advocacy by Jamaicans from all walks of life and from organizations in the private sector and civil society, the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, following much consultation, produced a report recommending robust campaign finance reform, including the banning of Olin-type organizations making contributions to political parties, including limits on what parties can spend, including limits on how much may be donated to a political party, and very importantly, recommending disclosure of those who give big money to the political parties. Happily, the Parliament of Jamaica in March of 2012 adopted this report in a historic move, with concerns and with reservations. The government has indicated that they intend to have campaign finance reform on the law books by March 2013. But you and I know how much delay there can be in the legislative process. We therefore need to come together, National Integrity Action, and each and every one of you, to demand that this legislation be on the law books before March 2013. No more election must take place in Jamaica without campaign finance reform.